work that I do around leadership coaching and facilitation inside organizations feels a lot like software. Cleaning up the interfaces, making sure the variables are clear, making sure people can understand and hear each other, and that organizations are in support of one another. And not surprisingly, on a large system like that, with 250 developers, I have something that changes over here, it affects the system over here. I say something over here, it affects the system over here, and they're not at all directly integrated with each other. So how do you work with that? And when I think of leadership, we are all just cogs inside the system, and the shifts and changes we make can affect people who are far away from us. So that's, um, so I bring a systems perspective from all the software work that I did during that time. I uh, went and got my MBA in MS in Finance, worked for an environmental firm for a year, and then left the workforce to start a family. Okay. So I spent 15 years out of the workforce, and during that time, uh, for any of you who are local here, I helped to uh, move the Lowe's Home Improvement from uh, where it was supposed to be across from the Target Shopping Center on Route 103, and it's now next to the Costco at 95 and 175. So I, uh, when they wanted to put commercial development in a residential area, and this was before social media, um, uh, I worked with and volunteered with a set of my community members to figure out a solution that would allow us to build an elementary school, uh, prevent the lows from going in, put an elementary school in, uh, build out the YMCA, and sell the property so people could uh, build properties there without impacting schools. So what that turned into is about a seven year project um, that I started with a public school architect who I met at the bus stop. And the way we uh, did it is we put together a design and a business plan for what it could look like for a reduced size land property and try to figure out how we could get the school built there. And um, there's some newspaper pictures of us being in front of the YMCA trying to get their attention. And eventually what happened is the, uh, the Lowe's Home Improvement was not approved. They dropped out of the project. The YMC was still interested in selling their land. Um, a, a senior living place was put in place, so uh, a homeowner was able to sell the property for 55 and over. The Lowe's Home Improvement moved away. The YMCA got money and was able to build the Dancil Family YMCA. The veterans, the VFW, was able to donate their land for the school. and. Um, and they were able to build an elementary school there, which is now called Veterans Elementary School, because of the veterans donation of the land. So um, and that happened over about six years. So when I was doing that work, I became really aware of like, one, the power of citizen engagement. Um, two, the, uh, that you could come up with an idea and uh, we, peddled it all around town. So we met with the Board of Education, we met with county council members, we met with the Department of Education, and we had conversations with these individual entities, including the Bethel Baptist Church, to try and convince them that, hey, there's a better solution out there that will serve the whole community. So well, there it is. Congratulations. Yeah, that's pretty exciting work. For somebody who's not in the workforce, <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. There's a lot of people who have incredible ideas, and it's not just in the workplace where they show up. You're not from the Midwest, right? That's true. Well, do you count, do you count Buffalo as a Midwest? Do I count what? Buffalo, New York is a Midwest. Um, Some people do, so I... <laughs> I don't. Yeah. Okay, so you're from Buffalo, New York. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Siblings. Mom and Dad. Yeah. Growing up, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, so I'm the middle. Okay. Yeah. You know. So uh, I have an older sister and a younger brother, um, and I have my my parents. Uh, my father worked at the university growing up, and I spent all my time in Buffalo, New York. And then um, I have first cousins <coughs> on five different continents, so I have family um, around the world. So I spent a lot of time like visiting family when I was young. So I traveled a lot. Cool. Yeah. And what prompted you to decide to go from Buffalo to Ohio State? You know, the Buckeyes. I mean, you got to go sports. So it was a big, um, 
I think there's a couple of things. I had a little radius around where I was allowed to go to school. So there was that piece that was influential. Um, I also really wanted, uh, I grew up as an athlete. Like that was what I really spent a lot of time doing. And so I wanted to keep that culture in my hemisphere. So I played soccer at Ohio State when I was there, uh, which was a great way just to meet people and stay into what I knew. Um, and really the embodiment of leadership is on the sports field. So, um, and then, you know, my sister went to Ohio State, my brother went to Ohio State, my parents didn't want to change the color of the house. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I got it. Buckeyes through and through. Well. <clears throat> what were some of the early lessons that you picked up from your parents, from your siblings, from your time at Ohio State? that you feel worked well for you as you produced your career to where you are today? Uh, great question. So, um, so many interesting influences, you know, of our, of, of the home life. So, um, I, I'll share a couple of things. So one is, is my, my father had a big role in establishing an MBA program in China, the first MBA program in China. And um, what I remember as a kid is my dad always traveling for months at a time. But when one of the times we went on a trip to China with him, and um, I, when I looked around, I, I, like you, I knew I wasn't responsible for fixing anything, so that felt good. But I, I looked around and everybody was dressed up in their Mao suits. So it was right after the Cultural Revolution. They're all wearing dark clothes, full length, uh, you know, and white shirts and hats and uh, black shoes. Everybody rode a state bicycle. So all the bicycles are the same. So you go and there's 500 bicycles. They are all black and white. They all have brown seats and they all have the same braking system. And you just, as a kid, you're like, how do you know which bike is yours? Like, and it grows during the day. Um, all the trees were about the size of my wrist. And I remember asking, why are all the trees the size of my wrist? And they said, because they were so poor, they had to cut them down to burn them for me. We drove around at Tiananmen Square in a car, we were like the only car. And when we were um, in the Forbidden City, it was almost completely empty. There was no people in there, because there was no locals allowed. There was two currencies. There was a foreign currency that foreigners could use, and a local currency. So you couldn't go into a local store and use your foreign currency, and you couldn't go into a foreign store and use your local currency. And I just remember just all these um, small things that really just, you know, raised my awareness almost immediately about the differences in our cultures and what we had. Um, and so I think that was a, being able to watch my father do that work and knowing how important it was for the country and wanting to elevate the opportunities for hundreds of millions of Chinese people. So I got to go back to China this summer. I went back with my daughters. And when I went there, um, I went to a small city called Weiling. So on the back of the 20 um, yuan is uh, these beautiful landscape Chinese paintings that you would see, and they're really the mountains in Weiling. They built an airport there, and they said, we have 20, Seven million domestic tourists a year go through this town. And, and then we have four million, I'm pretty sure they said four million international tourists. And this is 40 years after a country had no tourists at all. Like the millions of people that they're moving is incredible. So, um, so I would say there's a piece there that was a big part of me growing up. Just the commitment to something that's long-term and sustainable, that creates its own engine for growth, that provides the opportunity for millions of people to change their lives. You think that was ultimately where the spark for entrepreneurship may have started for you? Uh, it could be. It could be. What 
I really love about entrepreneurship is the opportunity to create something from nothing. It's the opportunity to see the seams and the places where you believe something else can be created in order to create its own <coughs> engine and ecosystem to affect more. So it mixes in, right, to the systems piece, right? If there's an engine moving over here, can I create an engine over here, and can it shift this one over here differently? Um, what does it look like to have a blank canvas? To be able to create something from nothing, but not, but with a purpose. Like anybody can create something from nothing, but if it doesn't fit into the system, or there's not a need for it, it's not going to thrive. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so you took you took a number of years off to raise a family. I did. And then who are not completely raised. I just need to say that. <laughs> Perfect. Um, then did you, then did you come back and immediately decide I'm going to go ahead and start my own firm? focus on leadership development training and the, and the concepts of conscious capitalism? Uh, I wouldn't say it all happened at once. So I, when I um, decided I was going to go back into the workforce, um, anybody who's a software knows it changes months at a time. And so taking uh, a decade off feels really, really different. You almost have to relearn everything. And I was also in a place of saying, is that really the work I want to do? And in anyone who has raised people, or been engaged in a family, or been around other people, realizes that they're constantly shifting and changing all the time. And, um, and it changes you as a person when you're trying to work and raise these people. So I was a soccer coach for each of them. And what I loved about athletic coaching was um, I loved to take my left-footed players and put them on the right side. I hated it. I thought it was so fun to watch it develop, his right foot. Um, I used to take players um, who had a, a ton of effort and not necessarily a lot of innate talent and watch them, teach them systems, how the system of soccer works so they could be in a place of thriving. I really enjoyed that too. And I enjoyed watching them inside their systems. So it was always interesting to see the parent who's like, my kid is going to be the best player, and the kids who are like, oh, like they have to they're not necessarily in sync or the kid who's like i want to be really great at this and the parent who's like you know this is not going to be your future career it's okay for fun but we're not really going to turn this into something and so you just really start to recognize like we are all individuals and then we're inside a system that is in some ways we're trying to meet uh, to, to make it easier for all of us, and how our goals can diverge. But in sports, it's really easy, because you say, all I want to do is win. The goal is very clear. Anybody who gets on a, an athletic team, I know what I want to do, my goal is to win. But as a coach, I cannot make that the goal every time we go out to play. Every time we go to practice, it can't be the goal to win, because then we don't get better at anything. We only take the very best of what we already have and try and continue to use that. But it doesn't build the skill. So I lost the first season. I lost every game with the boys team. And I was like, this is maybe not so good. They were a little demoralized, but all we were trying to do is work on the number of times we touched the ball so we could get better at the skill set. Years later, we were undefeated. So there you go. It's about the investment of time and the commitment to the process and the belief that that process is going to get you to what you want. Did you get the boys to buy into the process? Were you able to break the traditional paradigm, <laughs> mental thinking of, of young boys in sports of winning at all costs and everything else be deemed? Um, you know what the hardest thing was? Being a female coach of adolescent boys. Yeah. Pray tell. <laughs> that was honestly, that was much, much harder than managing the boys. Because the boys, 
um, individually, they were okay. It was harder, I think, for me, like, because I, I want, of course, I wanted success. Um, but what I found is that uh, I was surrounded mostly by male coaches of boys, and that was a far different experience for my, for me trying to create something. Okay. So, at what point? You decide, I no longer want to do software development. I no longer want to be a, uh, you know, a, a software engineer. Yeah. Um, I, I want, at, what, what was that inflection point for you? What, what light went on? What was your aha moment that said, I believe I need to go down a different path for these reasons? Well, I think the software industry had changed so much. It was clear to me if I was going to do it, I was going to have to put a couple of years of investment into learning to go back into it. So I was pretty clear about that. Um, I really enjoy the human element of, uh, of being a part of shift and change over time, which is what parenting is, being a part of shift and change over seasons with the individual soccer players, and also working with them over a period of years. So it wasn't just one season we're done, it was fall, spring, fall, spring, fall, spring. So there was a lot of years that I got to work with those players. Um, and that um, was one piece. So it's, it's almost as if I can hop and skip and touch different places of my life, right? So um, I enjoyed being in systems, I enjoyed working on teams. I always played sports and I always played on a team, so that I wanted. I. Um, Noticed that I could build in my community and create a vision and drive a bunch of volunteers to try and help us create this vision that had a lot of different effect on different communities and I could bring that to life. And then I, one of the things about being out of the workforce for 15 years is uh, you don't quite have the network because you're not moving inside the business community quite as easily. And so I, um, it's almost as if the leadership coaching found me. I looked around at different organizations who were doing it, and uh, Georgetown being local uh, is really well respected in the coaching industry, and also uh, it was a brick and mortar in the sense that I could be a part of a community and be a part of a network. And so that was my landing spot for so it's really, it's a, like a substrate, right? Meaning, I just changed from, from the network to people. I changed from adolescents to leaders. And then I had to upskill my ability and bring in my previous work to try and continue to build what I was creating. Okay. The thing, the thing that that is standing out for me in, in, in many things that you said is that, and I'm gonna I'm gonna be very upfront with you, and that is, you, <clears throat> as we've known each other all the time, you always impressed me as being someone that is very focused, very driven, very intentional, and very pragmatic. As to that intentionality, intentionality is that the right word? Um, which I find a unique and relatively rare combination of skills and, and, and personality and, and essence of who you know who one is. Um, your thoughts? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Feels great. Um, I think the experience that we have of ourselves is really different than the experience that other people have of us. So it, it's um, lovely to hear about that. Um, and I don't think I sit through and go like, am I being intentional? Like, am I being practical? I think I, um, I generally move through, through the world with a strategic mind, so I'm, can't help but connect dots that, that 
others might not see as being connected. I'm naturally curious, so I'm always thinking about uh, what's happening in, you know, in different sectors of the world, not just business. You know, what's going on in medicine? What's going on in healthcare? What's going on in China? What's going on in Brazil? What's going on in the U.S.? Like, what's going on in Europe? Like, all of those things kind of move in my, just my natural way of consuming information. And then trying to pick out the pieces that connect, I think probably is like, comes easier to me. And it, and it just happens. Like, it's not something I really think about. So, so, Wumong Pep came before Conscious Capitalism, am I correct? Yes. Okay, walk us through that progression. How, how did you find or learn of the whole concept behind conscious capitalism? So it's interesting, they were looking, um, so the previous leader was looking for a facilitator for conscious, for one of the things they were doing with the board. And I said, oh yeah, sure, I'll do it. So that's the first time that I really stepped into that work. And I had you know gone to the beginning of conscious capitalism and I learned about the four pillars and I was felt a little bit outside of it, right? So you're kind of, you're coming in to facilitate, you step into an organization, you present to them, and then you, and then you leave. And, but what they were trying to do really spoke to what I believe to be true, which is, uh, in my experience, in seeing China emerge, I really felt that capitalism could be a way of elevating and when I think about how capitalism can be abused, it really had me in the question of how do you decide? Like, capitalism has no voice. So how do you decide what is the quote unquote right way to be a capitalist? And um, so I was intrigued by conscious capitalism. So that just, you know, you gather that data and it sits here. And I continue to do my work with leaders and as my work with leaders grew, you can't help but grow with your business, shift and change. And we'll talk about that more in a little bit, but in my work around that, and trying to be conscious about what I was trying to do and being intentional, I became more, the work that I was doing became closer to what conscious capitalism was modeling. And so it became natural for me to get to a place where I was engaged with the organization, and I would step into the leadership role which is a whole, uh, you know, felt, felt like a whole different ride um, as a student of leadership in coaching and then choosing to be in leadership as a leader. Those don't always feel the same. <coughs> Four pillars of conscious capitalism. Not just leadership. Okay. Conscious culture, higher purpose, and stakeholder orientation. Give us a brief description of the details that are more in each. Uh, quickest thing about conscious leadership, an organization can only grow to the capacity of their leadership. Meaning, if the leadership is at a certain level and the organization wants to scale, if the leadership doesn't scale, the organization can't grow. Um, it's a common reason why people leave organizations, because they're like, I've been trying to get this thing done, and I'm not gonna get it done. I've been trying to go through this bureaucracy, same thing all the time. They can't take it anymore and they leave. But if we were to work with those leaders and those leaders were to shift and change, that might create a different opportunity for the organization. So a lot of people leave companies because of that. And a lot of people suffer when companies operate in that way. So that's conscious leadership. And conscious culture is what does it feel like to be in the company? Right? What does it feel like when you go into a Starbucks? What does it feel like when you fly in Southwest or you fly in American Airlines? What does it feel like when you go into Starbucks? And um, they did a study with Harvard, uh, I'm pretty sure it was a Harvard study over 10 years, and they said that net income increased 756% uh, for companies committed to a conscious culture with a strong culture. Um, and also, people are not really sure, like, how do you so part of the work we do in conscious capitalism is trying to engage 
and bring together conscious leadership and conscious culture to help organizations be more thoughtful and intentional about the environment that they're creating for their business and the environment they're creating beyond their business. So that stakeholder orientation, not just about the work that I do in my business. I might be buying a product from somebody. I might be from a different department. It might be from a different organization. It might be just in time. Any of those things can be reasons why I need to pay attention to what my stakeholders, my stakeholder orientation, and, it, and um, like supply chain. I, um, I went to business school, and I was in negotiations class. And uh, <coughs> we're doing this, uh, this exercise uh, where I am uh, I'm negotiating with a bolt manufacturer, the only bolt manufacturer that makes the bolts for what I'm building. And, um, and we're in teams, so everybody's in the teams. And I was super excited to do this work, and I go in and I'm like I'm so stoked because I get the lowest price. And other people go through the exercise and they're like, we didn't get the lowest price, we didn't get the lowest price. And I was like, yes, I got the lowest price. And then we went for the debrief. And they're like, so how was your experience? And my, uh, my bullet manufacturer said, uh, she got the lowest price, but I will never negotiate with her again. And I thought, my company is going under because I don't have this bolt, <coughs> which was a really great exercise for me to realize that if you actually only pay attention to that, you have short-term gains and long-term losses. And if you're working in a just-in-time manufacturing environment and you have one person who's making this stuff for you and you're not good to that supplier, they're not gonna, they're not gonna take care of you either. So it's a great, for me, when I think about stakeholder orientation, it's why, if I, it's why I need to be thoughtful and intentional about the suppliers I engage with, the kind of work that they do, that the suppliers know a little bit about their supply chain too, who are the suppliers that they're working with, and how can we as an ecosystem be in a place of success. So when you think about the economy, if the economy drops in a horrible year, everyone drops. And if your suppliers go out of business, your business is going to go out of business too. So can we be in a place where we can both manage external forces? So if we are all impacted by the economy, our business doesn't disappear. So um, and the last one is higher purpose, and not last just because, but in this moment. Um, higher purpose says, uh, why am I doing this work? Why should we care? And what does it matter? So um, Larry Fink, uh, the CEO of, of BlackRock um, Investments, right, a $1 trillion company. And he has, for the last few years, put out his CEO letter. And he's been talking about uh, purpose and profit. And he was saying, you know, um, as an investor, right, if we are in high capitalism, it means we are reliant on capital moving. And as an as a investment company, they are looking to decide which companies they want to invest in. And he said, we need to know more about your purpose. We need to know about your stakeholders. We need to know about why it is you're doing the work you do. And we, you, you're going to need to make that visible to us, for us to decide if we're going to invest in you. So the model of how capital is being moved is changing too, which, you know, becomes, people can be more intentional about how they want to build a business, but people who are building businesses are often dependent on capital that's coming in from the outside. And so those capitalists can also decide how they want to be spending their money or doing investing their money. Several things that you said kind of go back to something that I have been studying, and that is the finite versus the infinite game. Where, historically, we've all been playing a very finite game. Finite game means number of players in the game. They may change, but they generally are a fixed number of players. What they generally agreed upon 
on this set of rules. And the essence is, you know, finite thing, in essence, you're playing a zero sum game. It's going to be a winner or winners, it's going to be a loser or losers. Whereas in an infinite game, there is no end point. There are an unknown number of players. And the rules get made up as you go along. So it's not a win-lose, zero-sum game. It's how do we perpetuate the game so that everybody comes out a winner? And to some degree, I'm hearing some parallels between those two, between conscious capitalism and the mindset of instead of being it's what's in it for me, it's what's in it for us, and that us being a larger universe than what the traditional profit oriented mindset might be. Thoughts? Um, I think it's um, I think it's really important so the model of capitalism exists on top of a model of economics. I come that way, profits that way. I'm going up. I'm good. And what? Um, and and one of the pieces around. Uh, so the so Simon Sinek's Infinite Game talks about five different pieces. But one of the things that I like to call out around capitalism is the importance of a different economic model. So they'll say that this economic model was developed in. 1700s with Adam Smith, went through any number of different iterations along the way. In the 1950s, we built it up to be a linear model, and now we talk about it as if growth is all that matters. And what we're not quite recognizing is the finite game is, I'm going to run out of land, I'm going to run out of gas, I'm going to run out of oil, I'm going to run out of, I'm going to run out of trees, my water is rising. Like, there's lots of things, actually, that are finite now, that were not finite in 1950. In 1950, we had 1 billion people on the planet. We have 10 billion people on the planet now. That happened in a very short time period. So we have to be really thoughtful now about how much do we really want to grow, and how much can I, we call it, compost. How much can I grow and also give back in a way that allows other things to flourish? So you use the term us. And I think we really need to be uh, thoughtful about who us really is. Because we can be intentional. For example, uh, someone can say, I can have an intern for you. The intern is willing to work for free. And I go, great. I have an intern who's willing to work for free. Do I have enough work for them? That actually, the only interns who can afford to work for free are the ones who have access to that. Because all the other people who still need jobs and still need to work can't afford to work for free. So they can't say yes to that. Can I really not afford an intern? Like, so I really need to be thoughtful about how am I enabling and creating as much access as possible to as many people to be part of the working community so, so they can build their own ecosystems and create their own economic engines that support their families beyond them and beyond. You and I talked about a number of companies that practice all or some of the four pillars of conscious capitalism in their own way, mm -hmm. like Southwest, um, Starbucks, uh, Costco, REI, Patagonia, <clears throat> just to name a few. And you you gave me some statistics the other day about companies that have have embraced the, that concept yeah. have significantly outperformed over time right. the generally accepted metrics that exist in business. Can you go into a little bit more about that? Yeah, thanks for asking. So um, the cumulative returns, they track them over three years, five years, 10 years, and 15 years. And what they, and then they, 
looked at it for uh, good to great companies. And what they noticed is that in three years, actually, they their cumulative returns are pretty similar. And at five years, they're moderately different. At 10 years, the, the statistics really start to change. They're almost four times what we call firms of endearment, companies that are focused on conscious culture, focused on the conscious capitalism pillars, almost four times the cumulative returns are higher. And by the time they get to 15 years, I think the ratio, I think the ratio was like 7.7 .7 to one about how much more they make in cumulative returns over time than good, even good to great companies. So when people think about, uh, should I do conscious capitalism? Like, why, do, why should I care, right? The results demonstrate that it matters. You know, 756% increase in net income for companies that are focused on conscious culture, 7.7 .7 to one ratio difference in 15 years in cumulative returns over companies that are good to great says that the numbers say that this can work. So let's take all of that down to a very local level. Great. Take it down to this room, this group. We are all small businesses. We yep. are entrepreneurs. Some of us are startups. Some of us are very established businesses. We can talk all we want about the four pillars. Let's talk about some <coughs> nitty gritty down in the dirt things that people here today could walk out and say, you know what, that makes a lot of sense. I'm going to see what I can do about trying that in my business tomorrow. But it starts with, it all starts with this mindset. And how do you coach business leaders who have been brought up in the traditional paradigm of linear profitability, et cetera? How do you help them change their mindset? Because that's really the starting point. You can't take a tactic today from tonight and apply it tomorrow unless you are looking at it from a broader perspective? Yeah, um, a great question. So I think uh, one is, is there is, we talked about mindset, right? We talked about the growth mindset. So if, if leaders are committed to being linear and that profits are the only thing that matter, they're never gonna show up as a coaching client. And if that leader consistently tries to do what they do and they are always bumping up, up against themselves or against their organization or their organization is not growing, they may reach a level of discomfort that will tell them, I need to be doing something differently or my business is going to die. And those are the clients that can emerge into a coaching engagement or into a coaching opportunity. And when we speak about, when I think about conscious leadership, Remember we talked about the cogs in the system? Mm -hmm. So if we think about leadership as a cog in the system, if you're a larger organization, you get to a place where if your, your leadership has to shift. And when I think about leadership, I think about it as like there's an inner circle and an outer circle. So the outer circle of leadership is how, do people, how does my leadership affect others? And the inner circle of leadership is what am I doing driven by my own challenges, my own internal challenges that are driving my which often emerge under very stressful conditions. So there's a lot of external forces at play. And sometimes it's not gonna work out in your favor. You can take healthcare, for example. The government decides tomorrow they're gonna write a different policy for healthcare. Every healthcare organization that's connected to that policy has to change. You don't get to decide when that happens. You don't know when it passes. And you might be part of that conversation. So you have to really say, well, what am I gonna do now for the business and how am I gonna turn it? And some of it is driven by my level of stress and how I manage myself, and that, that impacts the leadership of others. And so in coaching, the self-awareness piece and the growth mindset piece is really important. Can we teach mindset? Yes. Can I get invited to the table for people who don't wanna change their mindset? I don't know. I don't think they're gonna 
identify who's on the table. I'm happy to have the conversation around it, and I'm happy to walk them through opportunities and give them opportunities to shape what that might look like. But will they be ringing me up saying, I want to change my mindset? However, I think we are largely social beings. Surprise. And so, if they don't want to change, fine. But if everybody starts to change around them, they might get on board with that. So there's something about this, if, I'm, if everybody's not doing it, I'm not doing it either. But if everybody, a lot of people start to do it in my ecosystem and I notice good things are happening, I might do that. So I don't have to go in directly and say, this is a fixed mindset, let's offer a growth mindset. I can say, great, do your thing. We're gonna do our thing over here. And then you can decide, do I wanna step in or not? So let's now take that to conscious capitalism for a second. Yeah. Tell us about the chat. Um, how big is it? How often do you meet? What do you do in your chapter events, etc.? Is it some is yours an organization that people here tonight might be might be able to join and begin to participate in <coughs> some of the teachings that you're putting forth? So yes. Yes to all of that. So Conscious Capital is in Central Maryland. Um, so I've been the leader of it for about three years. It has 26 members. We, um, we meet about four times a year. So we have an, an Ignite, uh, we help to host Ignite, which is, uh, Ignite Howard County is part of a, like Startup Crime, is a, a small piece and a larger international piece of what Ignite is. So Ignite has um, 20 slides, 15 seconds a slide, five minutes to tell a story, you're on and off the stage. We have about 11 or 12 people who present. And uh, the beautiful piece about Ignite is the um, ability to bring lots of different community into the room. So I'm just going to do a quick aside. Um, I just heard a podcast uh, by uh, Hidden Brain, actually. Robert Schiller was an economist who won the Nobel Prize in 2013, who talked about narrative economics. And he said, economics is largely about storytelling and that businesses need to be telling the stories about what they're doing that's really good and that that story can become viral much in the way that other stories can become viral and so it's a really wonderful opportunity to think about how does ignite support the opportunity for businesses and humans to tell those stories that creates a different community for what we're engaged so we do that work in conscious capitalism in an effort to build community to elevate humanity, which may or may not be about the businesses they're in, and it may be about human experience. So that's one piece that we do. The other thing that we're building is the pieces around um, we're wanting to create a, a, like a morning workshop, so it's as yet to be named, that will provide people and organizations the opportunity to be a part of a learning environment, probably lasts about two and a half hours, and really talk about the four different pillars. So I can say, uh, well, I don't, I don't know, should I just focus on one pillar or focus on all four? Should I, what should I be doing for my business? And like education, it's customized for everybody. And how can we use the pillars as a way of helping us to manage uh, how we view our organization? So for example, I could say, uh, let's just put conscious leadership to the side. I could say, listen, I'm, I'm having a conversation with a supplier. And I need to be thinking about where I'm getting my product from. And I, I need to be thinking about how they're managing, creating the product. And what kind of conversation might that look like? Right, that's about stakeholder orientation and also about conscious leadership, right? How do I want to engage with that? And what kind of culture am I looking for in that organization? that supports the values that I'm creating in mind. So I can get anybody to create stuff for me. But will I pick anybody? How do I decide? I could decide based on price, but that goes back to the linear economic model. I could decide based on how they treat their employees. I could decide based on the other clients that they have. So you can use the pillars of conscious capitalism to stimulate 
your thought process around how you want to run your business. So as an organization, we're going to be, we are creating like essentially like a conscious boot camp, an opportunity for people to get together to be in that conversation and to learn from each other and to develop their own opportunities independently and then to check in to be in that. So the other thing we do is we provide um, opportunities for people to, uh, to speak and tell their story, develop their story. So our brains are attracted to negative information. I know this is shocking, but we are. And so um, <coughs> I often find that when we're talking with conscious businesses that we say, we're like, well, you know, do you have that story on your website? And they'll be like, mm, no, I don't have that story on my website. Well, like, why not? Well, everybody does it. Like, everybody takes care of their people like this. But it's actually not true. So there's a humility piece that I think is important that we put story to. And being in the practice of telling your story affects your culture, how you lead inside the company. It affects how you engage with other stakeholders. It affects how you might show up in media. It affects your blog posts. And all of that is about storytelling. How well can I tell the story of the work that we do that's compelling and true for our company? An awful lot. Got a lot going on in there. So, people can get involved in the conscious capitalism in the chat room. Yeah. What's the best way for them to do that? Uh, the best way to do it is to go to www.consciouscapitalismcmd.org and they can sign up and join there. Um, it's a great way to get involved with the organization. There's, um, and they want to check it out, they can go ahead and read the blog posts that have um, had quite a different uh, number of entries that tell a little bit of what, what our organization has done, and they can sign up for our newsletter that we send out. So they can be a part of when we're ready to um, step into the name, the date, and the time of the next um, engagement that they can be there for that. And there are a number of other rather influential people and organizations within this region that are involved in conscious capitalism. Um, and one of them I'm thinking is a good friend of ours, Jeff Cherry, yeah. the Conscious Venture Lab and Shift Ventures. Is Marianne here? Where is she? She was supposed to be here tonight, representing Jeff. Mm. Um, I guess she didn't make it. Um, are, there, are there others in a similar position of influence within the region that are involved in the chat? Um, so, uh, so the Conscious Venture Lab is an incubator. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I want to invite Conscious Capitalism DC into this conversation because they serve mid-sized companies and because they um, they are an organization that has provided, um, like, they have a speaker series and they've had speakers come in and speak to what Conscious Capitalism is. Um, so that would be like John Mack, Dan Ross, and Cynthia as like authors. Um, our, our organization is really going to be focusing on startups and entrepreneurs and small businesses. And we know that small businesses are actually kind of big. And 90, what is it, 97% of the businesses in this country are quote unquote small, small businesses. businesses. Yes. Right? And so we are wanting to be in, um, really to elevate the whole <coughs> vertical chain of businesses working with Conscious Capitalism of D.C. and also thinking about how do we reach down to the small, smaller, and smallest businesses, knowing that they're all intending to scale. So you, so now it doesn't matter where you step in, you step into Conscious Capitalism. I mean, <coughs> you've taken this interest and this love and this passion for Conscious Capitalism one step further. I have. And you found it, created it, um, I'm going to call you the head poobah. <laughs> well, there's a new title. Of, of the term. Conscious Collaboratory. Yeah. Tell us about that. What's, what's going on there? What's your, what's your mission and your purpose? And then we'll, we'll move on to the inviting some of them up to talk about. Terrific. Thanks. Um, so the Conscious Collaboratory was um, designed to leverage our differences new solutions to old problems. 
So one of the challenges that I see is, I see everybody saying the differences are what divide us, and I am a firm believer that it's the differences that actually make for better solutions. And I can't figure out how to get all those people into the room. So when I think about facilitating, I think a company hires me to facilitate and we do something. Another company hires me to facilitate and we do something. And I think to myself, why can't we just be in the same room and facilitate what I'm offering to both companies? And how can you learn from each other? Because we're so busy inside our own ecosystems, we don't easily see what the other ecosystem, business ecosystems are doing around us. We say, if you're in this sector of healthcare, you do it like this. If you're in this sector of finance, you do it like this. But what happens when you cross over? The reality is that you do finance in healthcare, and you do healthcare in finance. So why do we have to keep them so separate? So the collaboratory is really designed to say, how can I bring multiple different mindsets into the room to create to be in a place where we're developing together and not in competition with each other. And the premise being, if these organizations themselves become more conscious, I'm better off. If they become more intentional about saving the planet, I'm better off. If they become more thoughtful about how they engage with their suppliers, every day I go out the door, I'm better off. So that's what the collaboratory was designed for. So the way it has shaped itself is in the last year, I've had the wonderful opportunity to work with five organizations locally to be a part of a pilot program that says, let's take these businesses who are conscious business leaders, let's work in partnership with conscious capitalism, so it's my business and conscious capitalism in partnership, and let's come together as a group, let's invite some new ways of learning and developing leadership and then engaging in culture work that they can each individually learn in the space and then go off and bring to their organizations. And they're here tonight. So the collaboratory is not, quote unquote, an incubator or an accelerator. It is a collaboration platform for lack of a better term, for existing businesses who already practice a mindset of conscious capitalism in some way, working together to then take the whole concept to, to the next level within their own businesses and for the region itself. Am I close? You're close. So <coughs> I would say if you zoom out, the collaboratory is even bigger than that. Okay. You want to create a new idea? You want to figure out how to get more college students to go to college? Let's have a conversation at the collaboratory. Let's bring an economist in the room. Let's bring higher education into the room. Let's bring a finance into the room. Let's figure out how to do it. Those, it's intended to solve a big problem and bringing different minds into the room to have those conversations so we can fully create a process and a solution. So that's what the collaboratory is for. The, um, this conscious capitalism, this beautiful pilot of conscious cap with conscious capitalism is really around um, the things you talked about. So if I zoom in, I say, okay, so one, one, uh, one seat of the collaboratory is this piece, this ecosystem of learning and development around the conscious capitalism pillars to drive growth inside the organizations and separate from each other. <coughs> that being said, I think that's a perfect segue <coughs> into inviting some of those collaboratory members out, right? Yes, it okay. is. Okay, that Let's being said, um, I would like to invite um, <coughs> the representatives from um, Wendy Baird from Insight 180, um, Mobert Lighting, Indigo Inc., and Edgewise, as well as Wendy Slug. Please, all of you, come on up. Um, these are the members of the Conscious Collaboratory. Am I correct? Yeah. Okay. And I have here a handout that gives um, that gives a brief bio of. Um, 
each of the companies in the collaboratory so that they don't have to take up a lot of time telling you about who they are. We can focus a little bit more on the work that you're doing, et cetera, et cetera. But that having been said, what I would like to do is I'd like to start Wendy with you to just introduce yourself. Um, just give us a real high level of what you do yeah. and then how did you, what brought you into <coughs> conscious capitalism and the collaboratory? Um, hi, I'm Wendy Baird. Um, one of three Wendy's. <laughs> so Wendy's you're, in the wind. You're in. Mm -hmm. You're Wendy. Um, the alternative name is Wendy Zing. Exactly. Um, I am president of Insight 180 Brand Consulting and Design. I'm celebrating my 20th year in business this year, and I'm based in Ellicott City. And uh, years and years and years ago, I first became interested in, it wasn't really called conscious capitalism back then, but um, as designers and branders, we were working on um, uh, responsible care reports for chemical for the chemical industry. Um, after uh, companies um, like in Baltimore, there was a factory that blew up. And um, responding to that became a huge issue when companies are saying, hey, we're doing great, here's our annual report. Well, the industry kind of cracked down on themselves and said, hey, what about transparency? Who are your stakeholders? It's not just about your bottom line. It's about the community, the environment. And so we would do these reports that um, design these reports that really told the story, um, including addressing here's what we're doing to clean up our act kind of thing. So that appealed to me because as a marketer, sometimes you feel like a little, at least back then, if people would come to us, make us look like that person. Yeah, I don't want to do that. Like what we do is make people um, really tell their best story and we, we base it on the leader and on the authentic vision of the company. So that's why I became involved. And um, when Conscious Capitalism first came around, I was part of the initial membership team. And I think I might have just kind of talked Wendy Moomaw into becoming the executive director. She was part of a exploratory committee when we were trying to um, grow the, the organization. So. Uh, my name is Liz Richardson, and uh, me and my husband Matt own um, Indigo Inc. Digital Printing. We are um, working in Columbia. We started about 16 and a half years ago. And um, in my way of practicing conscious capitalism before I knew that was a thing, um, the environment has always been an important thing for me, and we're a printing company, so there was automatically some tension there and ways and, and and so we, from the beginning, we're always trying to think of ways that we could be more environmentally conscious in the way that we operate, um, the kinds of paper we use, the kinds of processes that we use. Um, but I have to say that when I read Yvonne Schnard's Let My People Go Surfing, oh gosh, this was probably like eight or nine years ago, that completely changed my entire worldview and my entire sort of reason for being in business to begin with. Um, and Patagonia. Yeah, that's, he's, a, he's the uh, founder of Patagonia. And um, that kind of lit a fire under me about um, why I was in business to begin with. And that, that was kind of the turning point for me. And so a few years after that is when I discovered conscious capitalism. I think that's when uh, John Mackey wrote the book Conscious Capitalism. And when I read that book, that's when I started to do some online searches to see, you know, maybe there are other companies in the local area that are doing this as well. And that's when I discovered Seeds and Unity and um, became involved three years ago. Do you know who I've been? I'm one of the non Wendy's. Oh, okay. It's <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. Wendy's, Wendy's fun. Um, so, um, and I. Uh, Edgewise, which is a executive coaching leadership development to organizational change uh, company. It's actually kind of brand new. Um, I also uh, manage a practice within a small enterprise engineering firm. We do a lot of government contracting within uh, defense intelligence agencies. So, um, and the focus of my work in that space is what we call a vertical development. And by that we mean how do you expand greater diversity of ways. 
it's like um, uh, when I was uh, in the 80s, I used to drive a, a 1968 VW bus. Not because I was a hippie, but because I lived in Oregon and I had no money and it's all I could afford. And if you ever changed gears in a vehicle like that, it's a visceral experience, right? You actually feel yourself shifting gears. And if you're lucky, you had three gears. And what I'm seeing with leaders, particularly today, in this very complex, uncertain time of business, is that you need to be able to expand your gear capacity. You need to have more than three so you can go off-road, you can deal with the uncertainty of the terrain ahead of you. And so that's what we do with the kind of work I do and the kind of coaching that, that Wendy and I do a lot of. Now how I bring that to, I'm actually an adjunct, I think myself as an adjunct to the collaboratory. I think Wendy invited me to help facilitate and then I said, Wendy, you can facilitate this. You don't need me, but let me, bring me in once in a while. So I love these folks and that's my part in it, um, supporting uh, where I can. I'm Bob Clare, the general manager of Mulward Lighting, and we're a 75 year old startup. Uh, and I say that because every day is a new day, yeah. and we grind through it every single day. Uh, we've doing, been doing it for a long time. Uh, for those of you who have never heard of us, we manufacture energy efficient lighting fixtures down in Jessup. Uh, we've been in Howard County since 1957. And uh, before I got into this uh, space, I was an Atlas Shrug capitalist, you know, when I, uh, I read in uh, business school. So for 40 years, that's all I thought was uh, capitalism was all about. And uh, I got into this, uh, Mulberg got into this uh, back in 2009 out of necessity when uh, after the uh, Great Recession, uh, our business um, overnight turned because our largest competitors could not their supply chains with uh, foreign suppliers really were shut down because of the banking system uh, uh, having shut down. Uh, we had the capital and resources to be able to uh, fit into opportunities uh, that our billion dollar competitors could not uh, take advantage of. And overnight we went from 35 people to 70. And uh, I literally had to drive down Route 1 uh, and fill my car up with people who were looking for jobs to come to work. In terms of conscious capitalism, the change agent, um, particularly in our space with emerging technologies and uh, different supply channels and customer uh, needs, uh, which are changing very, very rapidly. Now we're a tech company, we're not a lighting company. but. Um, the most important thing for me the past year uh, in uh, relation to the work that we've done in the collaboratory is the fact that we were re recently acquired by a very linear private equity group out of Chicago and now we have banks involved. So when you talk about the economic model, someone was talking about the change in the economic model, a bank imposes incredibly linear responsibilities and restrictions on companies. It's, it's a it's a noose around an entrepreneur's or a conscious leader's neck. And so I agreed to uh, participate in this because I needed help dealing upstream with our prior owners, with our new owners, with banks, with lawyers, with consultants. And uh, it's been uh, another day in the startup grind. So uh, very grateful for the opportunity to participate. And uh, so far, it's been successful. So, thank you. I'm another Wendy. Um, I'm Wendy Slaughter. And I'm incredibly grateful for Wendy Rumal and everyone who is up here right now. All of you, you're really awesome people. I feel lucky that I'm a part of this group. Um, I am the president of the Wendy Slaughter team. I actually own several real estate based companies, but for tonight's conversation, I'm going to focus on that. Um, I, like many of us here, were, um, we were, I was living, trying to live my values through my business and through my work. And at a young age, right out of undergrad, 
went to work for some companies and was disgusted by um, their decisions and the leadership and learned what not to do, basically, um, from a lot of those corporations and those companies and leadership styles that I didn't identify with at all. Um, so, and I learned a lot from my father who was self-employed. He was never the cheapest guy in town, but he did great work, he didn't win every job. I mean, he owned a little construction company. So um, between those really negative experiences after I graduated from college and um, my father, I feel like I incorporated a lot of the principles into my work before I even knew what they were called. Um, I didn't have language for it. And um, I can't remember how I got involved, but I'm a founding member of, um, <laughs> so I should remember how. Um, no, kid. Isn't it weird? Like I literally can't remember how I got involved in the chapter. Um, so my whole thing about this movement, which I think has been a movement for years, I think people have been operating this way and living this way. Is why wouldn't you? It just makes your life so much better and so much more meaningful and richer. And um, so doing the right thing um, also, and I'm happy to talk about you know statistics. I don't know what kind of questions you're gonna ask us, but I'm I'm the president of a top producing real estate team, and I'm proof that you can do things in a very different way and still be profitable and still be a top producing company. Um, All right, let's yeah. start with that. Okay. okay. What are you doing differently um, than what I would call your more traditional mm -hmm. real estate companies? Okay. What have you adopted in your organization that is different that you feel is contributing so much to your success? Yep. So I'm, I want to first talk, throw a few stats out, if that's okay, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to get to your question. So. My team is number eight in Howard County out of about 3,000 agents who do business in, the, in Howard County every year. Um, we're number 20 in Central Maryland. No one ever says, hey, guess what, I'm number 20, because it doesn't sound good. But there are about 12,000 agents who do business in Central Maryland. So there's proof that working this way, it, it can work. Um, what am I doing differently? A, a lot, just so much. Um, when you talk about stakeholders, so in our business, a lot of the top producing realtors, I'm gonna get really granular in detail here, a lot of the top producing agents are abusive towards their electricians, their plumbers, their painters, and they're very like, get out there or I'm never sending you business again. We throw vendor parties. We invite all of our vendors to come in every year and we celebrate them and thank them. We're constantly thanking them. Um, I'm not bragging no. about when I say that. No, we're not. It's just different. It's just a different way to operate. Um, internally, well, and I have to mention I've done a lot of work with Wendy. I hired Wendy as a, as a, as a coach, so she's helped me a lot. Um, our culture is very um, different. It's not a fear-based, and again, I'm talking, I'm comparing my team to larger successful real estate teams. Um, there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of, um, just the leadership style is different. We're very collaborative. I want to hear what everyone has to say and everyone knows that they have value um, in our organization. You know, I have to make the final decisions, but it's a, a comfortable, um, vulnerable, authentic group um, because we all let each other operate that way. Uh, I brought some. I brought some other things. We have our core values. So we have a brochure about our team. When you open that up on the right hand side, we list our core values, our ten core values, and they're things like um, laughing, uncorporate. Um, you know, they're they're weird. They're just weird for real estate, but it's a differentiator. So it's real. It comes from an authentic place. And it is a differentiator. When I'm sitting at a table, and so I compete all the time now for listings and um, for the business. When I'm sitting at a table and I'm having a conversation with sellers, they know, I check all the performance boxes, right? I check, we're number eight, we're number 20. We beat the average days on market 11 years in a row. So 
So I am confident that my marketing works. I feel very comfortable walking out and being confident about that. The piece that makes me different is that 88% of my business comes from referrals. So what does that mean? It means we're doing something right. That the way we're operating, putting people before profits, is resulting in 88% of our business coming from referrals. It's an unbelievable statistic. One stat that I'd yes. like for you to bring up. Your typical average run-of-the-mill competitive um, yeah. real estate company. What, tell, tell us about what their what average business from referrals ratio might be. I don't know it for sure. Uh, it's going to be gut, probably 30%. Okay. Right. The bigger teams, the, the smaller you know, independent agents and things, they rely on referrals. So I would say probably 50% of their business. So 88 is crazy. And it speaks to these principles. It's, we've been operating this way for years. You talked about how long it takes. And you mentioned those numbers about, you know, by year 10, was it? Who cares how long it takes? Like, I don't care. I mean, I, that's where I am now. It's been 14 years. My team's been around for 10 years. I don't care. I want, this is how I want to live. Mm -hmm. Like, it makes my life and everyone else who interacts with us it's just, life sucks and it's hard. Like, why would you make it worse? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, and I just want to say, when I walked into your office that time, and I walked in and thought, I just want to hang out here. <laughs> I mean, so you, you, you have a way of creating a space that actually embodies that. Indigo Inc., you talked about the fact that you're passionate about the environment and you were concerned about Indigo Inc.'s impact on the environment. Over time, what's changed for you and your husband relative to how you view Indigo Inc. and its impact on the environment? Has it expanded? Has it, have you evolved? Give us. Um, well, for us, it required a uh, Pretty big learning curve on um, on what we were doing and then what we could be doing differently. So uh, we started with the kinds of paper that we used. Um, this was gosh, over 10 years ago. Uh, we were looking at um, uh, there's a I don't know if you guys are familiar with FSC certification. Uh, what that means is that any wood product, whether it's a piece of furniture piece of paper, anything made out of wood um, can be certified that it comes from sustainable forestry practices and they're pretty stringent standards um, and at the time the paper that was available to us uh, were digital printers so the particular equipment that we use is digital it's not traditional offset. Um, we were very limited in the number of papers that were available to us that, that was FSC certified so we really had to actually push our vendors um, and our suppliers to see if, like, to encourage them to offer um, digital uh, papers that were FSC certified. So over time, that became more available. Um, but another value of ours is quality. We're, quality is about the most important for us. Um, so we had to find papers that were FSC certified that were also high quality and that our customers were coming so that was a kind of a long process of learning, experimenting. Um, they're not necessarily the cheapest papers, um, so making it work financially. That, that was sort of the biggest hurdle. Um, I can say that for a while, for a while now, we um, all of our house stocks that we that we currently stock in house, um, not like special order, but uh, in house stocks, are FSC certified except for the papers that are not made out of wood. So like we carry um, paper made out of cotton, I can't think of bamboo. bamboo. Well, actually that's wood, but I don't know if that was a LC certified, I don't know why. Um, but yeah, the, the traditional paper-based, or wood-based paper, um, all of ours are FSC certified. And that was an intentional process that we had to go through. Um, the other thing that we did was um, I happened to, um, 
and I was reading uh, Conscious Business Magazine, this was like 2015, and I happened to notice a little logo uh, in the magazine called Print Relief. So I reached out to the organization Print Relief to see what they were all about, and they were brand new. They were super excited to hear from me, even though I was a little peon with a little company in Columbia. Um, and we partnered with them, and so uh, we offer, we um, basically, the way Print Relief works is that we track all of the paper that we use, and then they um, take that number and generate um, a, an amount that is equivalent to the amount of trees that we used for that volume of paper, and then we contribute that amount, and they, they um, work with reforestation projects around the world. And so we started doing this in 2016, and as of now, we have planted uh, just over 6,500 trees since the beginning of that. So, so that's, that's, that makes us feel good, um, that we're making that kind of difference. Um, the other thing that we've done is um, just paying attention to the actual processes we use. For instance, our uh, large format, so we print things like that, that banner stand right there. Um, we use solvent-free inks. a lot to the community. I am a client of theirs and I try to refer them all the time, but I've come to them with some other nonprofits and things and they're just so wonderful in donating and that kind of thing. Although maybe I shouldn't have said that out loud. <laughs> well, I, I'll tell you right now, number one, you will be doing all my printing from here on out. And number two, when I decide to go to sell my house, you got the business. Thank How's you. that? Thank you so much. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Now, We've got, we've got some time for some Q&A, and I'm sure there are uh, questions that are out there. Um, I do want you to all, all to know that each one of our events is videotaped in full. And as soon as I do my poor, poor, poor job of editing and get it posted, it will be posted on the uh, chapter and our global organization websites for everybody to view at their pleasure. And it also goes into our global YouTube library, which ha right now has about six million minutes worth of educational information in there for the universe to see. And what I will be doing is sharing the video with all of you for your own purposes, and you will all be notified when it's up, so that if you want to go back and look at pieces or all of tonight, you're more than welcome to do so. Now, that being said, questions. I'm sure there have got to be some. Yes? About the printing. You spoke about how your company changed, but how was it getting your customers to accept, I assume, a higher price <laughs> your product? Well, we didn't necessarily raise our prices when we changed, which was a challenge for us. Okay. <laughs> um, we actually had to be willing to accept lower profit margins than we would have otherwise made. So by doing that, you increased your profit margins over the long term? Over the long haul, um, be, well, so um, we had to focus on the clients that really cared about this. If they didn't care, they weren't going to use us. They were going to use somebody cheaper. Mm -hmm. So how did you? I'm sorry, piggybacking off of how did you get that messaging out to your customers and your potential customers to identify the ones that would care and would want to come to you? Because we're very much in a Space. Well, we're still working on that. Not so, printing uh, space. I mean, yeah. uh, finding, matching up our mission with yeah. people who care about that mission. That is a, that is a work in progress. We've been doing it for a while, and I can say it will probably continue to be a work in progress. Um, some of it's marketing, um, but a lot of it is just one-on-one -on -one conversations and, and talking about it with our clients. It's just like a wonderful challenge for the collaboratory to do yeah. on, and to work on, you know, solving different new ways for the age age old issue. You know, it's funny I'll say too that as an as a client, I have a lot of opportunities to go to other printers and whenever I can, because of who they are and how they treat their employees and how they like they've solved problems for me. They've 
um, they've done sample sheets to because we aren't sure if it's going to look right on this weight stock or whatever. They take such good care of their clients that I want to go there more often. And I'll also, you know, I mean, I think I've handed out business cards for you guys, but um, I think it's that kind of thing that. Um, um, so one of the things that Von Chouinard talks about in his book that um, I found so transformational is um, for him, the environment was the most important as well for his company. But one thing that he learned along the way is that he had to have a company that was predominantly about quality. Um, and so they both had to be equally important. And so we kind of have that same challenge for us. Um, we still hold quality equally important to environment um, and also customer service. So we know that clients aren't just going to use us because we happen to be an environmentally friendly company. They're going to have they're going to want to use us for all the other reasons why you know, for quality and customer service. So so yeah, we have to be all three. Thank you, Wendy. <laughs> so I have a answer or a response to your question because we found it very difficult how to how to get our message across in our space because we're a very small player in a giant ginormous industry. So what we did was we had to work harder uh, to get out there and you know purvey the, the message. But we uh, affiliated with organizations of uh, that that our customers belong to. So for example, electrical contractors are bought the buyers of our lighting product. The builder community, the architectural community, industrial, uh, electrical engineers. So we engage in sponsorships of those organizations and I got a seat at the table because they wanted to hear what our story was about. Now I'm not saying that it, you know, it, generated double-digit increases in volume but it was able we were able to round out our brand and you know the, the, the uh, second chance employment opportunities appeal to a lot of people around in, in, in many different uh, areas of the country so that's important so that's how we that's how we do but you have to work harder really you know you can spend the money doing it but if you don't have it in your budget, you just have to get out there and work. So we talked a lot about, or you guys talked a lot about um, conscious capitalism. And a lot of what we're touching on right now sounds like capital consumerism, as well, uh, conscious consumerism as well. I'd be interested to see in the piece of storytelling how you can attract um, conscious consumers um, and what piece that has played um, for you both as uh, business owners, but also as a consumer. So um, I'll just start with the consumption piece. Every day you walk out, do you vote with your dollar? Every day you vote with your dollar. And where do you choose to put that dollar? And what do you know about the companies that you put it in? So we went out to eat one time, and we said, um, came in with a glass of something, and they said, you can't have that in here. And we're like, well, it's okay, we're almost done with it. it. Happened to be just going from down the street. And they said, you can't have that in here. And we said, and then we're like, oh yeah, they have really, really strict rules here. Like, you're not allowed, to, right? So that's a little bit of a fear-based culture, and I haven't been back to that restaurant since. When you go out and you yelp something, you say, was that food good? But what do you know about their culture? About how they treat their people? About, and then that's really, you know, restaurant industries especially are, have really, so I think we can be really conscious about how we consume. I take a water bottle with me almost everywhere. Everybody offers me a plastic water bottle, no matter where I go. Small meeting, a large meeting, I take a water bottle with me and I decline. And because I'm hoping that once they see they have 45 water bottles that nobody took, they'll choose to buy less. And then I won't have to, and so the system works backwards too. So the conscious consumerism piece, um, does anybody want to jump in here? Uh, the, the one piece that I noticed, so if I think about scarcity and abundance, there's a little bit of the piece around, I'm fearful that if I change my model, I'm gonna lose my customers. And I won't have those customers. And what I would say, the abundance mindset would say, there's thousands of customers out there, 
you, there will be a different customer that will show up. Because they do, I've noticed that they do self-select. They choose who they want to work with. And I think that conscious consumption is becoming more and more popular than ever. So you can see venture capital companies, if you, if you come up with a linear model, that is not going to be attractive to some venture capital companies. And you go to another one and they're interested in saying beyond capital. I want to know what you're doing for the environment. I want to know how you're treating your people. I want to know what your plan is for scaling. And now we can talk about numbers. So the models are already changing. And we're in kind of this period of time where it's, um, it feels like I have to let go of this to get that. And there is some factor of what's the story I'm telling about my business? that lets people know the work that I'm doing that is in the conscious realm that attracts the consumers who are interested in that work. And, and so that goes back to the marketing piece, because I think your question is how do you right. attract the conscious consumer? Um, and you, whatever industry you're in, whatever work you're doing, you have to figure out where are your people? Are they on Instagram or, you know, is it face-to-face? -face? Like, how are you, and how are you getting the story out? Like, I mean, just for me being here tonight and hearing you know, what everyone is talking about. I've written down like 15 things I need to do. I, I need to do a better job of getting my story out. Um, one thing that I'm well known for in the community is giving back. I serve on several boards. Um, I'm on the library board, I'm on the Girls on the Run board, and I was appointed to a county commission. Um, and I, I talk about that a lot. And I typically talk about it, not in a bragging way, but it, as an invitation would you like to get involved? This is how you can get involved. Um, my favorite thing that we do now is a food drive every year. It sounds ridiculously simple, but our past clients, our neighbors, our, our business neighbors, our neighbors from home, like everybody brings food in. And as a person who gives back a lot, it's one thing to write a check or give back. It's another thing to witness people giving back and provide that opportunity. Um, so, that's been a whole new experience for me. But again, like, you know, looking at the field that you're in and where are your people and how do you get your story out and why does it matter? And I think that's already happening. Like, people are looking. It's, it's completely shifted how businesses um, are doing business. And what we're seeing with a lot of clients that are coming to us saying, you know, we have plenty of customers. We need to attract uh, people to work with us and for us. So. Um, they're not getting that unless they've got the right message. So it becomes really important to tell that story. And um, it's so funny that you know you emphasize fear-based um, versus love for anything a greater. But a lot of um, clients in the mindset of well, I have to do it this way, and you know we're challenge challenging them to say well, you know, do you really have to do it that way? Because I would uh, I would much rather work for this guy who's laughing and telling me this story and how he wants to attract these people because like when I hear his why it's like that's what people want to read about and see and it's kind of turning traditional marketing and branding upside down but I think it's a good thing I think if there are one leadership quality that is most needed to be able to do this I would say it was courage and I say that because you know the root of courage is core is heart and what what you do has to come from it has to be so powerful in here and you have to show it everything you do because this is constantly coming up to that edge 